Hello and welcome to Winning Paths Podcast, your guide through the exhilarating world of archery. Whether you're a seasoned archer or just dipping your toes into the sport, this podcast is your go-to resource for everything archery related. Our podcast is a bi-weekly rendezvous with fresh episodes dropping every Sunday. We are thrilled to take you on a journey exploring the rich tapestry of archery, from its storied past to the cutting edge present and even glimpses into its exciting future. Winning Paths isn't just about the sport, it's a celebration of the passion and dedication that fuels the archery community. Join us for riveting monologues and insightful interviews, covering a spectrum of archery topics. From the historical roots that anchor our beloved sport to in-depth equipment reviews, we've got it all. Expect fascinating tidbits, little-known facts, and explorations of archery's role in historical and sociological contexts. In essence, it's your one-stop shop for all things archery and beyond. Your participation is crucial to the heartbeat of winning paths. If you have suggestions, insights, or a burning desire to share your own archery journey, we want to hear from you. Connect with us at tfm.news and become a part of shaping the podcast's future. At Winning Paths, we're on a mission to continually enhance your listening experience. We value your feedback and are dedicated to delivering maximum value to our community of archery enthusiasts. So, buckle up, stay tuned, and immerse yourself in the world of winning paths, where the pursuit of excellence in archery knows no bounds. Greetings, curious minds, and welcome to another enlightening episode of Winning Paths. I'm Marcin Malik, your guide through the labyrinth corridors of historical trajectories. Today, we embark on a journey into the fascinating topic of the Church's ban on bows and crossbows in warfare as we unravel the intricacies of a narrative both ethereal and visceral, where weapons of war collide with the moral fabric spun by ecclesiastical decrees, from the mysterious origins of projectile weaponry to the emergence of iconic bows like the Welsh longbow. Our exploration will traverse continents and epochs. Join me as we navigate the evolutionary maze of bows, arrows, and crossbows, witnessing their metamorphosis from tools of war to symbols entwined with ethical considerations. Synods, prohibitions, and nuanced reflections await as we unravel the paradoxical tapestry of the Church's ban on these formidable instruments. So prepare for a riveting exploration. Welcome to Winning Paths, where history is not just a tale, but a labyrinth of enlightening discoveries. It is imperative to acknowledge the genesis of today's episode, a scholarly endeavor enriched by the research conducted by Master of Science Daniel Marek of the Pontifical University of John Paul II in Krakow. The profound insights presented in his work, titled Prohibition of the Use of a Bow and Crossbow in the Medieval Thought of the Catholic Church about the War, have been a pivotal source of inspiration for the thematic exploration unfolding in this podcast. Encountering Mr. Marek's research during the quest for compelling podcast topics proved fortuitous, igniting an intellectual spark that has led to the translation and presentation of his work in English. Should you wish to delve deeper into the intricacies of this subject, the original publication is accessible in Polish in Acta Universitatis Lodziensis, Folia Historica, Instrumenta Belli, edited by Witold Jarno, with the publication date being September 8, 2023. The elucidation of the progenitors of the bow and arrow, or the precise loci of its origination, presents an intricate challenge within contemporary perspectives. Presumably, this developmental trajectory was characterized by the incremental refinement of individual components constituting projectile weaponry, converging into a unified tool. Archaeological evidence, prominently embodied by arrowheads and cave paintings, attests to the early utilization of bows during the Paleolithic era. The genesis of this innovative weapon is conjectured to have transpired in the cradle of humanity, possibly in Africa, subsequently diffusing through the Iberian Peninsula into Europe with successive migratory waves. Primarily a hunting and combat apparatus, the bow exhibited multifaceted functionality, serving as a tool for Neolithic operations, fire kindling, woolen strip weaving, and even contributing to the orchestration of primitive musical compositions through induced string vibrations. Additionally, arrowheads assumed roles as commodities and quasi-currency. 
the iconic imagery of the bow and archer, permeates ancient literary works such as the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Iliad, the Odyssey, and the Old Testament. It finds manifestation in a plethora of artistic expressions, including paintings and reliefs spanning Sumerian, Babylonian, Assyrian, Egyptian, Persian, and Greek cultures. While bows were integral to the Roman army's auxiliary units, their prominence diminished post the Western Roman Empire's collapse, notably due to the limited use of projectile weapons by Germanic armies. The revival of European bowcraft materialized in the British Isles with the development of the Welsh longbow. In medieval times, cavalry adopted shorter bows, coexisting with longbows and continental bows in Europe. The taxonomy of bows diversified, encompassing longbows prevalent in England, continental bows predominant in France, and reflex bows borrowed from Eastern influences. The military relevance of bows endured until the 17th century, when firearms definitively supplanted them, although bows persisted in sporadic military deployments, such as during World War I and II. Bow designs exhibited considerable diversity, ranging from simple to Eastern or Asian types, angular, reflex, short, and long. Construction materials included horn, bone, sinew, wood, iron, or combinations thereof, resulting in composite bows. Much like the bow, the exact genesis of the crossbow eludes precise historical reconstruction based on current knowledge. Its earliest documented use traces back to China in the 6th century BCE, with subsequent development of a repeating crossbow in the 4th century BCE, albeit with limited dissemination beyond Asia. In ancient Europe, crossbows found employment among the Celts, Greeks, and Romans, an intriguing historical anecdote emerges from the Crusades, where Anna Komnene's accounts highlight the unfamiliarity of the Eastern Roman Empire with the crossbow, leading to the Greeks labeling it as diabolical. Resurfacing on the European military stage in the early 11th century, the crossbow proliferated during medieval sieges and through mercenary companies. By the 16th century, its prominence waned in favour of firearms, leading to specific disbandment of crossbow units in France in 1527. While bows persisted in European armies for an additional two centuries, the crossbow found a niche as a primarily hunting weapon. In technical parlance, a crossbow manifests as a bow oriented perpendicularly to the stock, featuring a trigger mechanism. When taxonomizing crossbows according to their applications, one can delineate categories such as heavy combat crossbows deployed by infantry and their lighter counterparts for cavalry, fixed crossbows, windlass operated models, hunting crossbows, automatic variants designed for ambushes, and those fashioned for sports. Noteworthy among them are repeating crossbows, combined iterations capable of projecting bolts and gunpowder, propelled projectiles interchangeably, those incorporating a blade in lieu of a stirrup, and those employing multiple bows tensioned by screws. Loading mechanisms are diverse, encompassing the use of the leg and stirrup, a combined squatting and standing motion, string manipulation via a waist-hung hook, crank mechanisms, or specialized levers, colloquially referred to as a goat's foot. The projectiles employed also exhibit diversity, ranging from bolts to stone, iron, or lead balls. The ecclesiastical standpoint of the Catholic Church regarding the deployment of bows and crossbows crystallized during the Middle Ages, despite the symbolic presence of projectile weaponry in pivotal religious texts. References to the use of bows and arrows span from the Book of Genesis 21.20-27.3 to the Book of Revelation 6.2 within the Holy Scripture, predominantly portraying the bow as a formidable instrument of war and a tool for execution. Biblical narratives underscore the archer's precision and lethal accuracy in combat scenarios, with foreign armies prominently featuring archers in various roles. Archery emerges as a symbolic motif in biblical literature, portraying divine wrath, instrumentality in divine retribution, and symbolizing human vulnerability before the inexorable judgment of God. In the New Testament, St. Paul allegorically warns believers of devilish assaults depicted as fiery arrows, exhorting them to seek refuge in the shield of faith, Ephesians 6.16. Noteworthy is the biblical symbolism associating peace with the dismantling of bows and arrows, Psalm 46.10, Hosea 2.20, Zechariah 
9.10. However, a broken bow also serves as a metaphor for Israel's defeat, Hosea 1.5, and symbolizes individuals deemed unreliable and untrustworthy by God, Psalm 78.57, Hosea 7-16. While archery is often depicted through negative symbols, biblical authors also extol its positive facets. Psalm 18, a triumphant ode celebrating a warrior's victory on the battlefield, attributes strength and skill to the archer as a divine endowment. Psalm 127 metaphorically illustrates the blessing of abundant offspring through the contentment of an archer with a quiver full of arrows. Psalm 127.3.5 Several passages underscore that the archer symbolizes not only skill and the capacity to instill fear, but also courage and valor, as evident in Isaiah's portrayal of the servant of the Lord as a sharpened arrow concealed in God's quiver, Isaiah 49.2. In the annals of ancient Middle Eastern literature, a distinctive divine parallelism was attributed to virtually every human weapon, with the bow assuming a transcendent significance beyond its role as a mere armament employed by deities such as Montu, Esher, Apollo, Artemis, and Eros, as well as various mythical heroes, the bow and arrow held a prominent position across diverse cultural landscapes, spanning from Mesopotamia to Greece. The Bible, replete with references to God's arrows, similarly embedded this celestial armament within its narrative fabric. Rooted in a pre-scientific worldview, the conceptualization of inexplicable phenomena was intricately woven into an ethereal tapestry that mirrored the observable reality. The righteous were envisioned as combatants engaged in a spiritual struggle, wherein imperceptible weapons wielded by higher powers manifested their effects in the corporeal realm. In this paradigm, the arrow emerged as a poignant emblem of divine intervention in the physical world, distinguishing itself from other weapons through its characteristic attributes of long-range precision, swiftness, stealth, and seemingly capricious trajectories, rendering it not only a feared instrument in the visible domain, but also the quintessential symbol of divine justice. The ancient ecclesiastical perspective on the bow, akin to other weapons, relegated it to a role utilized relatively infrequently, with more nuanced reflections on war and its implements crystallizing in the medieval period. The Church, since antiquity, grappled with the reconciliation of the soldier's profession with the ethical precepts encapsulated in the Fifth Commandment. The moral impurity associated with military service found expression in rigorous penitential practices, wherein participants, irrespective of the justness of their cause, underwent public penance post every battle, at least until the 11th century. As the concept of a just war matured, the ecclesiastical perspective evolved, albeit with the prohibition of the clergy engaging in military service persisting, thereby maintaining an element of moral ambiguity. Notably, early medieval penitential literature failed to differentiate the bow and crossbow, with records limited to their purported use in magical contexts. It wasn't until the 11th century that a discernible shift in the treatment of projectile weapons is evident. The Synod of Winchester in 1076 marked a turning point by stipulating penance for combatants, wherein the gravity of transgressions determined the duration and nature of penitential acts. Archers were prescribed a distinct penance regimen, attesting to a nascent differentiation within ecclesiastical discourse. Subsequently, the Lateran Synod in 1097, under Pope Urban II, instituted a prohibition specifically against the use of crossbows on fellow Christians. This prohibition, encompassing bows as well, was formalized in the canon of the Second Lateran Council in 1139, unequivocally condemning the deadly and God-hateful art of crossbows and archery in conflicts involving Christians and Catholics. While absent from Gratian's decree, the prohibition found resonance in the Decretals of Gregory IX, compiled in 1234 by Raymond of Peñafort, a preeminent medieval jurist, thus underscoring its enduring canonical significance within the Corpus Juris Canonici. The verbatim expression of Canon 29 ostensibly conveys a definitive stance, yet in practical terms, its implementation would have portended the near extinction of archer and crossbowman formations within medieval armies. However, historical evidence belies this purported obsolescence. Archers constituted integral components of European military forces from their inception, a status unaltered by the provisions of the 1139 Council. In England, their prominence burgeoned from the mid-13th century, accentuated by the advent of the Welsh longbow. 
injecting newfound vigour into projectile weaponry. By the denouement of Edward Thurn's rule, archers constituted a preponderant faction within his infantry. The statute of Richard II in 1389 exemplifies this ascendancy, proscribing servants and labourers from recreational pursuits on Sundays and holidays, redirecting their focus toward archery practice. A parallel injunction was promulgated in 1384 by Charles VI, enjoining individuals to devote their leisure to archery and crossbow proficiency, though this directive proved evanescent in the face of organised resistance. A comparable resilience characterised the crossbow, popularised by Richard the Lionheart in France, circa 1185, an instrument paradoxically implicated in his demise during the 1199 siege of Charles Chabrol. From the late 12th century, crossbows proliferated across diverse troop categories, land and naval forces, infantry and cavalry, particularly in sieges and southern European campaigns. Historical records attest to their widespread adoption, with notable instances such as Raymond VII, Count of Provence, offering the Pope a contingent comprising 40 knights and 10 mounted crossbowmen in 1239. Notable commanders, including Frederick II and John Lackland, enlisted crossbowmen in their campaigns, underscoring the weapon's ubiquity. Archival records from the 13th century enumerate an inventory in the Capetian domain comprising 266,000 arrows and 278 crossbows of diverse materials and mechanisms. The 1250 garrison of Saft in the Holy Land boasted 300 crossbowmen. Crossbows experienced continuous refinement, evidenced by the advent of pavisé shields to mitigate prolonged reloading times. The 14th century witnessed a surge in the prevalence of shooters within European armies, culminating in Charles VII establishing a militia of 8,000 free archers in 1448. The mid-14th century witnessed the formation of archery fraternities, alongside analogous fraternities of crossbowmen and spearmen. Flemish crossbow fraternities venerated St. George, while archery fraternities found perpetual pastoral guidance under St. Sebastian. The weapon's endurance and development persisted, exemplified by the perpetuation of these fraternities and their ecclesiastical affiliations. Throughout the expanse of military literature during the Middle Ages, a pronounced emphasis on the strategic import of archers is discernible. This predilection is evident in the Expugnatio Hibernica, circa 1185, by Gerald of Wales, wherein he posits the efficacy of combating the Irish through the employment of a composite formation comprising archers and cavalry units. Similarly, the Liber Recuperationis Terre Sancte of Fidencius of Padua advocates the recruitment of units armed with bows and crossbows for engagements against the Saracens. In a memorial to Philip the Good, Duke of Burgundy, in 1432, Bertrand de la Broquière on visions an army capable of liberating the Holy Land, characterized by the inclusion of French archers, infantry crossbowmen wielding windlass crossbows, and German cavalry, complemented by a contingent of 10,000 English archers. Interpreting ecclesiastical sanctions imposed on archer formations prompts scholarly inquiry. Some scholars attribute these restrictions to considerations of the efficacy of weaponry or prevailing social contexts, either singly or in tandem, influencing the prohibition against deploying crossbows and bows. Notably, mercenaries played a substantial role in the deployment of projectile weapons. Mercenary companies, comprised of skilled warriors, including Saracen archers and crossbowmen from various regions such as Genoa, Pisa, Tortosa, Liguria and Corsica, were instrumental in military campaigns. These companies, sought for their martial prowess, offered rulers a sense of security, owing to their apolitical orientation, driven solely by pecuniary motivations. The genesis of mercenary companies, often metamorphosing into outlaw bands, can be attributed to a confluence of political, economic, and social factors. In the late 12th century, Walter Mapp vividly depicted mercenaries as formidable entities, noting their proliferation into formidable phalanxes, capable of traversing provinces and kingdoms as adversaries of both God and men. Persistent challenges with mercenary troops punctuated the annals of the Middle Ages, with significant issues emerging in medieval France during the transitional periods of the late 12th and 13th centuries, the third quarter of the 14th century, characterized by the companies, and post-1435, an era marked by marauders. The disruptive impact, 
widespread destruction, and chaos instigated by undisciplined mercenary forces culminated in the church's condemnation, equating mercenaries with heretics. This dance, formalized during the Third Lateran Council in 1179, sought to curtail the influence of these military entities. However, intriguingly, this not dissuade Philip Augustus from engaging mercenaries in his military pursuits. It is pertinent to acknowledge that apprehensions regarding mercenary armies were not singular. For instance, the Magna Carta, 1215, explicitly called for the expulsion of foreign soldiers. However, it becomes apparent that the issue of mercenaries alone did not precipitate the ecclesiastical prohibition on the use of bows and crossbows, given their conspicuous absence from the Council deliberations of 1139. This intriguing historical conundrum underscores the multifaceted nature of the deliberations on weaponry and the intricate interplay of political, economic and martial dynamics during the medieval epoch. To gain insight into the proscription on the use of bows and crossbows, an exploration of medieval jurists' and theologians' interpretations within the ecclesiastical milieu becomes imperative. While Gratian's Decretum does not enunciate such a prohibition, its emergence in the decretals of Pope Gregory IX becomes a pivotal point of consideration. The medieval construal of Canon 29 of the Lateran Council, crucially, permitted the use of projectile weapons in conflicts against heretics and infidels. The crux of the matter, however, lay in the utilization of bows and crossbows in engagements between Christians, a context intricately entwined with the notion of a just war. Distinguished ecclesiastical figures, including Richard the Anglican, Damasus, Raymond of Peñafort, and John of God, propounded interpretations, underscoring the literal application of the prohibition, extending even to just wars. Early decretalists, the commentators predating the compilation of decretals in 1234, generally sanctioned the use of these weapons against Christians in a just war positing that all means were admissible under such circumstances. Later decretalists, however, advocated for the prohibition in unjust wars. Henry of Sousa, renowned as Hostiensis, in his Summa, intricately categorized armed conflicts into seven classifications, contending that sanctions on bows and crossbows should encompass both lawful and unlawful wars, excluding the Roman war against unbelievers, especially Saracens. Notably, in a just war, Hostiensis maintained that all means were permissible, emphasizing that only the laity, not the clergy, could wield these weapons. Interestingly, no analogous condemnation of other weapons emerged, despite potential differences in effectiveness. The theological dimension is further enriched by exploring the works of Thomas Aquinas and his Dominican contemporaries, Raymond of Peñafort and John of Freiburg, Thomas Aquinas's Summa Theologiae predominantly focuses on the justifiability of war and its conduct, eschewing explicit considerations on bows and crossbows. In contrast, Raymond's Summa de Cassibus Penitentiae et Matrimoni, completed between 1224 and 1226, took a stringent stance against the use of bows and crossbows, except in combat against pagans and persecutors of the Catholic faith. John of Freiburg, in his Summa Confessorum, completed before 1298, aligned with Raymond, but posited that the prohibition was restricted to unjust wars, affirming the righteous use of bows and crossbows in just wars. He elucidated that a just war necessitated legitimate authority, aiming to restore law or defend against aggression. The imposition of restrictions on bows and crossbows, intricately interlinked with the discourse on just wars, War, as a cultural phenomenon, is ensconced in its own conceptual framework, shaped by customs, law, morality, and religion. This framework serves to guide and regulate warfare, mitigating its deleterious impact on human life. The intricate web of laws governing combat evolved with the civilization of societies, adding layers of complexity to the considerations surrounding weaponry in the medieval milieu. Christian doctrinal influence on barbarian rulers initially encountered divergence as early Christian thinkers, including Tertullian, Origen, and Lactantius, harbored skepticism, if not outright hostility, towards warfare. This sentiment shifted with the conversion of the Roman Empire and its rulers, 
leading to an abandonment of pacifist notions. While early Christian thought deemed private war as objectionable, war in a general context found acceptance within the sacred scriptures of Christianity. The Old Testament, replete with instances of war, characterizes God as the Lord of hosts. Similarly, in the New Testament, the Baptist John imparts guidance to soldiers, Luke 3.14, and St. Paul employs military imagery to elucidate faith, Ephesians 6.14-18. Over time, Christianity undertook a process of introspection regarding warfare, seeking to imbue it with Christian principles. St. Ambrose endorsed defensive war against barbarians and bandits, aligning with Prudentius, who equated Pax Romana with Pax Christiana. St. Athanasius the Great lauded the act of killing the enemy in a just war. In the early 5th century, Emperor Theodosius excluded pagans from military service. St. Augustine, a seminal figure in early Christian thought, pivotal in shaping subsequent church doctrines, posited that true peace was unattainable in this world, necessitating the consideration of war even in a Christian state. Augustine, often regarded as the doctor of grace, delineated the conditions of a just war, emphasizing its pursuit of peace, justice, rectification of wrongs, recovery of seized property, or defense of persons or goods. Crucially, a just war required declaration and conduct by a legally reigning ruler who bore responsibility if the war proved unjust. Augustine's philosophy depicted war as both a consequence of sin and a means to combat it, casting a ruler leading a war as the whip of God. In essence, those who love well also punish well, according to Augustine's thesis. The incursions of Germanic tribes into Roman territories witnessed brutal campaigns characterized by minimal restraint in the treatment of prisoners and the vanquished. The only mitigating factors were the fear of gods or a desire for supernatural protection. Clovis, for instance, curtailed the devastation around Tours as a mark of respect for St. Martin. Preserving discipline in the army was facilitated by prohibitions against chaotic looting with the prospect of ransom serving to reduce mortality. The Germanic tribes, settling in Roman territories, exhibited quasi-legal structures related to war, such as heraldic initiation, throwing weapons ceremoniously, and observing certain gate-related customs in cities. However, the survival of Roman customs was uneven, with Spain and Italy being notable exceptions. Despite Isidore of Seville's elucidation of Aius Militare and Aius Gentium in his work Etymologiae, the practical incorporation of these considerations into wartime practices took time to manifest. Christianity, with its ethical foundations, embarked on a mission to temper the harsh realities of warfare, achieving notable success during the Carolingian era, when a discernible shift towards less brutality in conflict emerged compared to the preceding Merovingian dynasty. The propagation of mercy aimed to circumscribe massacres and looting, accompanied by a conscientious endeavor to attend to the welfare of the fallen and wounded. A fascinating historical episode illustrating this ethical nuance is the Battle of Fontenoy in 841. Despite being deemed a divine judgment and unequivocally affirming the righteousness of the victorious faction, a three-day fast was imposed upon all combatants. This incident underscored the acknowledgement that even in a just war, certain actions were deemed impermissible. The framework of Justum Bellum delineating the parameters of just war served to mitigate the horrors of conflict, albeit leaving an indelible mark that necessitated atonement. The Christianization of barbarian customs found expression in Pope Nicholas I's correspondence with the Bulgarians in 866, admonishing them for indiscriminate killing of enemies, including women and children, post-battle. The pontiff mandated penance and urged the abandonment of pagan beliefs in favor of their Christian commitment. The practice of penance for shedding blood in war persisted as a consistent feature until the 11th century, irrespective of the circumstances surrounding the conflict. Basil the Great advocated withholding communion from any soldier for three years in the event of taking a life, a period longer than that prescribed for ordinary murderers, which was eleven years. Archbishop Theodore of Canterbury, in the seventh century, articulated that individuals executing someone under senior orders were barred from entering the church for forty days. 
Similar stipulations were evident in Anglo-Saxon penitential rituals, where Bede's penitential ritual recommended forty days of fasting, a sentiment echoed in penitentials from the 8th and 10th centuries. The Arundel penitential, dating to the late 10th century, reverted to a three-year fasting regimen, while Fulbert of Chartres in the early 11th century proposed a penance period of one year. Burchard of Worms, in his seminal work, Correcta Sive Medicus, stipulated a three-year penance for participants in a just war. Over time, a nuanced distinction emerged in penitentials between killing in a just war and an unjust one, with participants in the latter held accountable as if committing murder. The perspective of St. Augustine, who initially justified all soldiers fighting for an unjust cause based on obedience, gradually waned. Instead, the evolving ethos necessitated fighters, either individually or with the guidance of a confessor, to meticulously discern the justness of their actions in the theatre of war. There existed a doctrinal perspective asserting that penance need not be imposed upon those engaged in just wars. A case in point is discernible in Rabanus Morris's epistle, wherein, post the Battle of Fontenoy, some individuals justified soldiers, contending that their participation in a righteous cause rendered penance unnecessary. Nevertheless, up until the culmination of the 11th century, Penance was consistently prescribed for combatants, even extending to general penance, as exemplified in instances such as the Battle of Soissons, 923, and the Battle of Hastings, with penance imposed merely four years post its occurrence, in 1070. The process of Christianizing warfare and the involvement of ecclesiastical authorities therein contributed to the secularization of martial customs and the sacralization of virtues associated with combat. Over time, an act that previously attracted penance, metamorphosed into one eligible for plenary indulgence, contingent upon the engagement being in defense of the Church, as illustrated by the actions of Pope Stephen II, Leo IV, and Leo IX. The endeavors to temper the brutality of war until the mid-tenth century yielded less significant results compared to the subsequent three centuries. The peace program in Western Europe not only forbade looting, but also sought to elevate warfare to a metaphysical and cosmological plane. The objective was to direct war against chaos and violence at the levels of the body, soul, and societal structures. In the medieval epoch, the Western Church's approach to the matter of war unfolded in three discernible stages. The first phase, 10th-11th century, was marked by a struggle against violence through diverse peace movements, peace and truce of God, leagues of peace. The second phase, 11th-13th century, witnessed the reformed papacy leveraging chivalry to ensure peace within Christianity, crusade movement targeting non-believers and heretics. The third phase, 13th-15th century, marked the evolution of just war, ultimately aiming to establish peaceful relations between neighboring kingdoms, royal wars. The initial instrument wielded by the Church against violence was the peace movement, instigated by the Peace of God initiative also denoted as Pactum Pacis, Constitutio Pacis, Restaturatio Pacis, et Justitiae, or Pax Reformanda. Originating in Western Aquitaine, the peace movement targeted powerful figures and knights disrupting the peace. Joint assemblies of peasants, clergy, and soldiers, milites, witnessed the latter pledging to uphold the church's assets and protect peasants, vowing to combat those engaged in plunder. Over time, nobles also participated in peace gatherings, and malefactors attacking churches or preying on the vulnerable faced ecclesiastical censure. These peace assemblies evolved into formal peace leagues around the 11th century. Beyond pledging to preserve peace, league members offered mutual support against those fomenting discord and devastation. In 1038, Bishop Amon of Bourges mandated every able-bodied man above fifteen to resist those disturbing the peace, even resorting to arms if necessary. The overarching objective of peace leagues encompassed curbing everyday violence, extortion, illicit fines, plunder, and raids, as well as constraining private wars, wera. Their protective ambit extended to places of sanctity, temples, vulnerable individuals, clergy, merchants, pilgrims, peasants, noblewomen, widows, nuns, and property, farmers, merchants. 
The monastic hub in Cluny played a pivotal role in fostering the peace movement, with monks and knights emerging as staunch advocates of the oath. Odilo, the 11th century abbot of Cluny, actively contributed to the broadening of the peace of God concept, instituting a proscription on fighting during specific days and liturgical periods as part of the truce of God. The truce of God made its inaugural appearance at the Synod in Toulouse in 1027, instituting a mandated cessation of all hostilities within a delineated region from 9 p.m. on Saturday until prime on Monday. Evolving over time, the observance of the truce of God expanded its reach to encompass regions such as Provence, Italy, Aquitaine, Burgundy, and Normandy. Concurrently, a more extended period of peace was defined, stretching from Vespers on Wednesday to sunrise on Monday. Under the stewardship of Popes Nicholas II and Urban II, Concerted efforts were undertaken to extend this peace initiative to encompass all of Christianity. Simultaneously, new periods of abstention from warfare were introduced, including Advent, the Christmas season, Lent, the Easter season, the duration between the cross days and the octave of Pentecost, three Marian feasts with their vigils, and numerous individual saints' feasts. Importantly, the truce of God did not prescribe wars defined by the concept of bellum. According to the prevailing stance among canonists and theologians, a just war faced no restrictions, with Aquinas himself asserting the permissibility of combat on the most solemn days, a view not universally shared, as evidenced by Rufinus, Summa Decretorum. The peace movement, rooted in the framework of chivalry, emerged as a response to the relative weakness of central authority. Concurrently, the Church endeavoured to shape the ethos of the knightly calling. The life of St. Gerald of Aurillac, as chronicled by Abbot Odo in 930, exemplified the possibility of a knight attaining holiness, elevating combat to a spiritual and salvific value for soldiers. Anselm of Luca underscored that a soldier could lead a righteous life, while Bonizo of Sutri, in the Liber de Vita Christiana, 11th century, delineated the duties of chivalry, emphasizing loyalty to one's lord, refraining from plunder, combating heretics and schismatics, defending the vulnerable, and upholding one's word, the knightly ideal gained popularity, crystallizing around the 12th century and enduring into the 14th century, exemplified by works such as De Planctu Ecclesi by Alvarez Pelayo. In the crucible of battle, a Christian warrior was expected to embody virtue, Setting himself apart from the pagan warrior driven by unbridled frenzy, this overarching trend, seeking to imbue knighthood with spiritual significance and Christianize its ethos, aligned with the Gregorian reform spearheaded by Pope Gregory VII. The Church, recognizing the absence of robust royal authority as a catalyst for discord, sought to circumvent intermediaries and directly address professional warriors. However, the pursuit of peace inadvertently set in motion the militarization of the church, saintly figures with a martial past, such as George, Longinus, Martin, Maurice, Sebastian, Secundus, and Theodore, were canonized, underscoring the church's acknowledgement that war need not be inherently reprehensible. The Golden Legend, by Jacob de Voragine, portrayed these saintly warriors as heroes, establishing a profound connection between spiritual and physical warfare. This confluence of spiritual and military courage culminated in martyrdom, giving rise to the concept of holy war, the crusade. Bonzio of Sutri championed the concept of penance on the battlefield, a notion not alien to ninth-century popes who believed that a soldier with an untainted heart, falling in combat against non-believers, secured eternal life. The assurance of absolution for the deceased prompted Ivo of Chartres to assert that demise in defense of faith merits heavenly rewards. Simultaneously, Pope Leo IX accorded the status of martyrs to fallen knights in the Battle of Civitate in 1053, recognizing their valor in the pursuit of justice. The ideal of penitential warfare served to reconcile theological uncertainties surrounding the potential sinfulness of any action associated with war. Combat was elevated to the status of prayer, acts of mercy, or fasting, 
this concept undeniably propelled knighthood into the pursuit of salvation. The evolution of the just war concept served as a legal apex for peace movements, marking an attempt at a definitive demarcation of the limitations of war. Gratian, in question 23rd of the second part of the decree, stipulated that waging war itself is not a sin, emphasizing that only specific actions during warfare are deemed sinful. Additionally, he underscored the significance of soldierly service, mandating obedience even to a prince prelate. A just war, as per Gratian, required declaration by a legitimate ruler, defensive or aimed at reclaiming stolen goods, and explicit exclusion of clergy participation. It was not to involve widespread violence and unrestrained brutality. Rufinus, in his work Summa Decretorum, expounded that the justness of a war hinges on who declares it, who wages it, and against whom it is waged. Uncertainty about any of these conditions renders a war unjust. Huguccio succinctly affirmed that a war is just when proclaimed by a just edict of the prince. In the early 13th century, Laurentius Hispanus, in the work Apparatus, circa 1210, delineated five classical criteria elucidating the essential elements of a just war, the person, secular, the object, recovery of goods or defense of the homeland, the cause, out of necessity, the spirit, cannot be waged out of hatred or greed, and authority, legitimate ruler. These criteria gained popularity through the writings of Saint Raymond of Peñafort. In the 14th century, the Italian expert in civil law, Pietro Baldo de Ubaldis, provided commentary solidifying these criteria. Henry of Susa, followed by John of Legnano, articulated seven types of war, four deemed as just, Roman, legal, allowable, defensive, and three regarded unjust, presumptuous, audacious, arbitrary. This comprehensive classification encapsulated the myriad conflicts defined by medieval legal thought, delineating the final framework of a just war for the Middle Ages, with subsequent thinkers in the 14th and 15th centuries introducing no substantive innovations. The underlying rationale for the prohibition instated by the Second Lateran Council and the endeavour to circumscribe the deployment of projectile weapons in medieval European military operations lies in the perceived peril associated with crossbows and bows during the Middle Ages. These armaments, acknowledged for their formidable efficacy, garnered particular attention due to their prevalent usage among mercenary troops, individuals hailing from non-noble classes who operated outside the confines of chivalric norms. This demographic was often stigmatized as marauders and, in some instances, equated with heretics. In a bid to mitigate the intensity of violence in medieval conflicts, the Church, cognizant of the influence wielded by the knighthood, sought to regulate these projectile weapons, considering archers as formidable adversaries within the knightly order. The restriction on the use of projectile weapons sought to mitigate the severity of bloodshed, a sentiment somewhat substantiated by a concurrent prohibition imposed on knightly tournaments during the 1139 Council. What commenced as a modest attempt to temper violence through peace movements burgeoned into a more substantial impact when, from the mid-11th century onward, the Church experienced the epoch of the so-called Gregorian Reform. This comprehensive reform, overseen by canonical thinkers, extended its purview to encompass various facets of human existence, war conduct included. The thorough restructuring of the Western Church aspired to systematize and subordinate it to papal authority, ultimately giving rise to the medieval Societas Christiana. This Societas, guided by the clergy, navigated its trajectory toward a profound encounter with Christ. Well, friends, congratulations on your endurance, for you have persevered with me to the end of this fascinating journey through the annals of bow and crossbow history. I extend my heartfelt gratitude for embarking on this scholarly sojourn with the Winning Paths podcast. Today's episode has transported us across epochs and cultures, unveiling the multifaceted roles of these iconic weapons. Your discerning ears 
have indulged in the nuances of projectile weaponry, from the Paleolithic prowess of bows to the intricacies of crossbow mechanics. Together, we've navigated through biblical symbolism, medieval military formations, and even delved into the complexities of ecclesiastical perspectives on warfare. As we gently release the bowstring of this episode, I implore you to linger a moment longer in our auditory realm. Your support fuels our intellectual journey, and we invite you to stay tuned for more captivating explorations into the realms of history, culture, and academia. Be sure to follow, subscribe, and share the Winning Paths podcast with fellow seekers of knowledge. In the spirit of anticipation, for aficionados of historical narratives, I extend an earnest invitation to immerse yourselves in the forthcoming series of scholarly episodes. The inaugural installment, Battle of Crecy, 1346, a comparative analysis of archery and crossbow tactics, is scheduled to be inaugurated into our repository on the Christmas Eve, 24 December. Subsequently, on the cusp of 31st December, we shall delve into the intricacies of the historical tapestry with the episode titled Upon St. Crispin's Day, a chronicle of historical significance. Lastly, on 7th of January 2024, our podcast will unveil the absorbing account titled The Tale of the Virgin of Orleans, an examination of historical narratives. Evidently, this sequence of episodes will compose a succinct but comprehensive mini-series, explaining the nuanced events and dynamics characterizing the epoch of the 100 Years' War. Prepare to be intellectually invigorated as we meticulously dissect historical events with academic rigor, bridging the chasm between erudition and entertainment. Oh, and don't forget about this Sunday episode on myths, legends, ghostly archers, aliens, and God only knows what else. See you all at the range.